Armenia and Azerbaijan are accusing each other of moving troops to their border areas. Tensions have been rising in the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region. But why is this a concern now? And what's the role of foreign powers? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. The chaotic and rapid collapse of the Soviet Union more than 30 years ago left some unresolved and complex political disputes. One between Azerbaijan and Armenia over the Nagorno-Karabakh region has seen thousands of people killed or injured in conflict since those times. And after a brief but bloody war less than three years ago, tensions are escalating once again. So why is this happening now and where might it lead? And what role are Russia, the US, EU and Turkey are playing in this dispute? We'll discuss all of this with our guests shortly. But first, this report from Sarah Khairat. Skirmishes that broke out again between Azerbaijan and Armenia earlier this month, killing and injuring soldiers, have escalated with both sides accusing each other of a military build-up at the border. That's despite their commitment to a peace process in landlocked Nagorno-Karabakh. The military political situation in our region has seriously deteriorated in the past week. That's because Azerbaijan has been amassing troops for several days along the contact line between Nagorno-Karabakh and the Armenian-Azerbaijani border. But Azerbaijan insists Armenia is the instigator. Armenia still does not demonstrate goodwill and fails to take a constructive position. Instead, the Armenian side is playing a game of delay and confusion. Nagorno-Karabakh is a mountainous region with a 95% ethnic Armenian population that lies within Azerbaijan's territory. It's recognized internationally as part of Azerbaijan, but controlled by ethnic Armenian forces. The former Soviet republics have fought two wars for control of this region, a six-year conflict that ended with a ceasefire in 1994, then again in 2020, when more than 5,000 people were killed. While a Russian-brokered ceasefire ended that war and Armenia was forced to give up much of the land it controlled, tensions have continued to simmer. Armenia says Nagorno-Karabakh has been under blockade since December, accusing Azerbaijan of cutting off its 120,000 residents. Azerbaijan says it does allow supplies in, but maintains the enclave's only direct route to Armenia, the Lachin Corridor, has been used to smuggle weapons. Last week, the U.S. called the humanitarian situation there deeply concerning, with people unable to access food easily. Russia has called for aid to be allowed in. We're acting within the framework of the trilateral agreements by the leaders of Russia, Azerbaijan and Armenia in 2020 to 2022. We stand for unhindered access to humanitarian aid into the region. We call on all sides to refrain from unnecessarily politicizing this matter. Nagorno-Karabakh is a focal point of complex and shifting geopolitical alliances involving the US, Russia, Turkey and the EU. So far, international efforts to find a lasting solution haven't succeeded in resolving this decades-long conflict. Sara Khairat for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests in Baku, Farid Shafiev, chairman at the Center of Analysis of International Relations and a former Azerbaijanian ambassador to Canada. In Concord, Massachusetts, Anna Ohanian, professor of international relations at Stonehill College and the author of The Neighborhood Effect, The Imperial Roots of Regional Fracture in Eurasia. And in Berlin, Ben Aris, founder and editor-in-chief of BNE IntelliNews, a business media company focusing on emerging markets. Ben's also the former Moscow bureau chief for The Daily Telegraph. A warm welcome to you all. I'd like to begin in Baku with uh, Farid. Now, Farid, uh, we've already seen the accusation and the counter-accusation coming from Azerbaijan and Armenia. But there was, at one point, a peace process, uh, and it seemed to be working. Why has that seemingly broken down? Well, a couple of reasons. Indeed, we had quite positive development. And finally, uh, after so many years, um, uh, Armenian President Nikol Pashinyan 
who previously said that the Karabakh is Armenia, finally he acknowledged that Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan, uh, as it's internationally recognized. And uh, both countries worked on the draft of the peace agreement. But when uh, things get uh, worse, there is tense situation in uh, on the ground. There are still uh, illegal troops on Azerbaijan's territory in Karabakh region of Azerbaijan. I think the, some external forces also uh, gave um, negative influence. Um, Russia playing kind of double role. At one hand, it's the peacekeeping forces deployed there. Uh, on the other hand, Russia still wants to control the, the whole South Caucasus, both countries. So we are looking for some um, leverages. And there are some external forces, I believe, uh, countries like France, we are more bending to demand from radical elements of Armenian diaspora. Um, so we are interfering into negotiation process and giving one-sided statements to support Armenia, which is not conducive to the peace. So that's my opinion why we have um, tense situation on the ground. Uh, let me bring in Anna here. Anna, we've got several players in this conflict that aren't Armenia, that aren't Azerbaijan. We've got Russia, the US, the EU and Turkey. Now, all of those have differing agendas. Um, and seemingly, we're at a broken down peace process once again. I mean, their, their roles aren't helpful right now. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and to Farid for the comments. I do think that obviously geopolitical lens is important, but at the same time, I would not minimize the agency and the role of local actors, Armenia and Azerbaijan, but Azerbaijan in particular, simply because it won the war in 2020. So this period is very fragile. Post-war processes are fragile. They either lead to the next war or consolidate the fragile peace. Emerging as victorious, Azerbaijan essentially won the war, but President Aliyev is struggling to win the peace. Uh, with the peace process has been, Russia obviously does play a role, but Azerbaijan has been pulling in Russia much more than it could have otherwise. The Western peace track has been moving, trying to move um, the, the peace process institutionalizing by protecting the minorities, um, as opposed to simply um, uh, getting rid of the rights of the group rights of the Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians, which are internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan. And just to provide a little bit more context in terms of big data, since 1970s, the number of ethnic conflicts has been going down and the research is connected to the increased willingness of states to accommodate, provide group rights in, right. in cases of ethnic conflict. Uh, ben, what do you think of that statement? Pashinyan is struggling to win the peace. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, indeed. I mean, he was comprehensively defeated militarily in the uh, in the war in 2020. And, you know, Azerbaijan has been taking its oil wealth, the economy has been booming uh, ever since it was hooked up to a pipeline that managed to get its oil out to the international markets. And it spent a lot of that money on arming itself. At the same time, it developed these drones. The drones we're seeing in Ukraine, you know, the Azerbaijanis were the ones that pioneered that and used them to devastating effect during the conflict. And so uh, Pashinyan is on his back foot now. Um, militarily, he's weak, he can't defend the territory, he didn't win the war, and um, he's casting around now for a solution. <clears throat> and there was a tripartite ceasefire agreement brokered by Russia between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Um, but that hasn't been working, um, as my colleagues are suggesting that the Russians haven't really stepped up to their responsibilities, because under the CSTO, this um, collective security or uh, treatment agreement that they have, Russia is supposed to be the guarantor of um, peace and, and security in the region. And it hasn't really managed to do that. It's sort of been distracted increasingly by Ukraine recently. Um, but it didn't do a very good job of bringing the war to end or brokering a lasting ceasefire. And so now you have this very tense situation where Azerbaijan is blocking the Lachin Corridor, the only route out of Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia. 
and that area is predominantly populated by Armenians. And I think this is the root of the problem that, you know, everyone agrees that the, the, the territory of Nagorno Karabakh is uh, Azeri and has been since uh, recognized from the beginning, but it's overwhelmingly populated by Armenians. And, and that's the problem. Um, I think Azerbaijan is, is trying to push those people out or would like to take it under its full control, but they're still there. And this blockade right. is all about persuading the locals to go. Um, Anna, what uh, Fareed uh, Shafiev actually said was that Russia was playing a double game when it came to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. That's kind of been iterate, uh, reiterated by Ben as well, who says Russia may have been not playing a double game, but distracted certainly by perhaps Ukraine. Is Russia still the peace broker that we need it to be? Um, I do agree with Farid's comments that Russia might be playing a double game. Before I attend to that, let me just add a particular point. I do not think that um, uh, the, the condition, again, Azerbaijan emerging as victorious, there is a myth of Azerbaijan uh, offer, offering an alternative for energy for Europe. The GDP per capita in Azerbaijan is right now the lowest in the South Caucasus. So I do think that the way this conflict will be resolved, whether Nagorno-Karabakh as an entity will be provided right or not, this is a very much goes at the heart of the political identity of the Azerbaijani state. Um, so that's a little bit on that. In regards to Russia, Russia's policy in managing conflicts before the war in Ukraine has been described by researchers as authoritarian conflict management, meaning that there is a signature as to how Russia gets involved and mediates, and several of my books have been focused on this. I do agree that Russia is playing a double game. I do not, it's, uh, uh, it's not, I don't think it is distracted by uh, the war in Ukraine. I think that that thesis is um, overestimating Russia's capacities. Russia historically has been playing multiple roles and, in various theaters around vast territory of Eurasian continent. I do think that Russia, by not implementing the very agreement that it uh, negotiated, ended the war, uh, by essentially pushing back against rules, against transparency, that's one way as attacking the global system of mm. the liberal rules-based world order. So right. I think Russia is playing that game. And Lachin Corridor, the blockade in particular, which is in that agreement, which Russia is not uh, uh, is not protecting the opening of the Lachin corridor. Is also has been issued a ruling by the International Court of Justice. Lachin corridor is a linchpin to a peace process that can be institutionalized. That can, with peace researchers, described as quality peace. That can provide predictability, transparency, security, and dignity to the ethnic group. So while on the one hand, this is a massive humanitarian crisis, the blockade subjecting community to hunger, but from the political perspective, Baku is using that as a way to avoid political accommodation with the Nagorno-Karabakh, which has enjoyed self-governance since 1920, when it was part of Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan. Let me bring in Fareed here. Is uh, Baku avoiding political accommodation deliberately? You know, um, it's the conceptual things, uh, first of all. When we're speaking about uh, unilaterally rights and securities of Armenians in Karabakh or elsewhere, we should also speak about rights and security of Azerbaijanis. And remember that uh, the whole Armenia was ethnically cleansed from Azerbaijanis, not only Armenia, but the, currently even the territory which is on the uh, control of Russian peacekeepers. There is no Azerbaijani single left there. So um, Armenians had autonomy. Azerbaijan offered during the years of occupation highest degree of autonomy for Armenians within Azerbaijan, but it's all were declined. So uh, now Azerbaijan offering the reintegration of Armenians into Azerbaijan's jurisdiction. I have to make comments because two of my colleagues said about Lachin Corridor. Um, we should remember that the Lachin is the first region outside of Nagorno-Karabakh, which was occupied in 1992. And through that occupation, it allowed Armenians to attack from both directions our regions of Azerbaijan and occupy them. So Lachin is the road not only for humanitarian, but also was for military rotation and military supply for Armenians. 
it's paramount important for Armenians uh, for Azerbaijan to control it. By the way, uh, despite that, Azerbaijan offered to Armenia after the war that let's keep Lachin open without uh, custom or passport control. But the same Azerbaijan asked for uh, from Armenia to have route to Nakhchivan. If uh, my colleagues refer to trilateral agreement, which was signed after the war, it has both uh, clauses about Lachin and also the way from Azerbaijan to Nakhchivan. But Armenian side refused. And what Azerbaijan did, it uh, established custom and uh, passport control. And I think from the point of international but Farid, law... Farid, whilst <laughs> all of this was going on, whilst all of this continues to happen, there is a massive humanitarian crisis unfolding in Nagorno-Karabakh. There, there is no food in many of the supermarkets. A lot of businesses are going bust. That is happening. So we're uh, at a crux yeah. point here. You need to do something. Something needs to happen. And nothing seems to be happening. What's the hold-up you at know, your end? Azerbaijan offered uh, alternative routes. Azerbaijan offered uh, humanitarian help, aid to Karabakh Armenians. But I think it's the intransigence of Karabakh Armenians and also they would like to show sort of theatrics to the global media that we are starving and nobody has helping them. If they need food, food is available, route is available, they should comply with Azerbaijan's uh, jurisdiction. Ben. There's a very interesting word that was used there, the theatrics of the global media. These people aren't actually starving, they just can't come up with an agreement. What do you make of that? Well, I think you're right. There is a humanitarian crisis there. People are starving. The stories coming out, the pictures of uh, supermarkets, empty shelves. Um, we had a report the other day of uh, one of the, a mother whose, whose child had died as a result of this uh, blockade around the, the region. And uh, the French, um, the, the mayor of Paris was uh, just on the border about 10 days ago with trucks full of food, uh, a couple of hundred tons worth of food, and tried to cross into the, uh, into the enclave, into Karabakh, and was refused by the border guards. And so there is a deliberate policy there of blocking the entrance of this, of this humanitarian aid, these supplies, that um, the entire Karabakh relies on that Nachin corridor for supplies of food. Uh, in order to keep his people fed. And so I think Azerbaijan is just playing hardball here uh, in so much as they blocked off the enclave uh, in order to push through their, their political agenda by effectively by force, by uh, starving the local population into submission. And, and that's, you know, that's a hard line to take. Um, the alternatives, I don't think, are realistic. And at the same time, all of the, uh, the gas, the electricity, the connection to the internet has been cut off. Uh, and so the, the, the region really has been completely isolated from the outside world. Anna, one of the big problems uh, about the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is the lack of a peace broker that both sides can agree on. Russia was almost uh, the best of a bad bunch. Nobody could really agree that the US should be involved in this. Nobody really thought the EU should be uh, involved in this. Neither side was, was that. But we're now at a stage where perhaps there needs to be an alternative peace broker with a strong role to play. But can you see one that all sides can agree on? Um, <clears throat> uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> my voice is cracking. I do agree, a quick point, I do agree with Ben's description of what's going on in the ground. In regards to Agdam Road, I think that's a local road sooner or later, perhaps it will be opened, uh, will be used, I'm assuming, as a, a supplement, not an alternative to Lachin Corridor. But I do want to highlight that President Aliyev is using the Agdam War, uh, I'm sorry, Agdam Road, as a strategy of a hybrid warfare, meaning using the peace process, coercing a population maximalist agendas without using military force, which can be quite costly for, for Baku. Um, and that's problematic, um, needless to say. But that was, could go so away if there was a peace process that was actually working. And that's the question I'm asking you. Is there a peace exactly. broker that everybody can agree to? 
I think so far, both Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan have actually been working. The level of diplomatic activity between them has been unprecedented. They have utilized the Russian channel and they have utilized the Western channel. Uh, the absence of Nagorno-Karabakh from the negotiation table is hugely problematic because the peace research data shows that peace processes that are not inclusive do not have a high chance of being implemented. As to a credible third party uh, that could fill this void, I do think it's a matter of um, whether we're looking, um, uh, Russian uh, process is obviously uh, self-serving. Russia also in Plato, it has the skill, has been able to stop the war, but has not stopped the bleeding, but it has not been able to uh, heal the wound, so to speak. Whether I do think that it is important to move the process to the Western track, whether it's the United States, whether it's a Western country, whether it's the EU that has been playing an important role, and the EU European powers do have leverage over Azerbaijan, which I do think holds a lot of cards right now. Baku has a lot of agency. And um, in that respect, I'm finding the November 9 agreement now increasingly defunct because the Lachin corridor is blocked. Um, the uh, border opening is not happening, right. um, which would have created interdependencies between the two nations, Armenia and Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan's own borders uh, the, are closed to traffic, or they're open only to cargo as well as air flights. So Azerbaijan itself has closed its borders to its neighbors. And I'm quite pessimistic that Azerbaijan is willing to open the borders and Armenia has offered to open the borders to Azerbaijan to allow maximum connectivity between Azerbaijan and the right. Nakhichevan and Kuwait. Uh, Fareed, let me bring Fareed, let me bring you in here. Um, there is a problem with the borders; they are shut. We do know this, but uh, there's also the fact that um, we're talking about peace broking here and, and trying to get these borders open and get the goods and trade flowing back into Nagorno-Karabakh. But the Russians aren't being able to do it. The U.S. has about 85 uh, troops on the Armenian side making it, not perhaps a, a honest broker in the peace process. Is there a, a peace broker that would you would be satisfied with, that the Armenians would be satisfied with as well? I would like to highlight, the, if you would like to deliver humanitarian aid, you apply to the government and the government tell you uh, which way you're going to uh, supply uh, humanitarian aid. That's because the both of my colleagues insisted that Lachinis corridor is blocked and Azerbaijan is not allowing humanitarian aid. The mayor of France, uh, of Paris, she brought without uh, coordination with Azerbaijan. And again, uh, there is some routes uh, for supply, but it should be done with coordination with uh, central authorities in Baku. As far as for the peace process, um, it's very complex, uh, but its core element is the recognition of territorial integrity of two countries, Armenia and Azerbaijan. We, on one hand, uh, heard from Pashinyan positive uh, statement that he recognized Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan. But lately, just a few days ago, he sent a uh, congratulatory letter to, on the occasion of so-called independence of Nagorno-Karabakh. So it's two contradictory uh, statements. Uh, so that's why we need an ambiguous um, position. We need uh, firm commitments moving toward uh, a peace treaty based on the mutual right. recognition of territorial uh, integrity of two countries. And one point about open borders. Uh, Azerbaijan, again, I repeat, in 2021, offered Armenians to open borders. Uh, but I don't know, for some reasons, we only uh, uh, discussed Lachin and we're not uh, discussing the uh, route for Azerbaijan to Nakhchivan. Uh, ben, it. you've been a veteran of the region for many, many years. Uh, there is no accommodation right now. There's no peace process right now. Uh, but we're not looking at another shooting war, or are we? Well, the situation on the border is, is still unstable. I mean, there are occasional clashes, um, shooting incidents. But, I mean, as to this thing about the peace process, um, I mean, I, what I'm seeing here is that it's all starting to splinter in so much as uh, Pashinin is, is fed up, he's, he's frustrated that he's not making any progress. And um, the security deal, the CSTO, the, the NATO of, of the former Soviet Union, if you like, 
Um, we're supposed to provide that, but um, this week or the week finished, um, the CSTO are, are holding exercises, and they were supposed to happen in uh, in Armenia this year, but uh, um, Yerevan refused to hold them, and they ended up being moved to to Minsk, um, which was a, a major slap in the face for this collective security deal. And then what's happening, uh, what's about to happen now, is that uh, America has been invited to hold military exercises together with um, Armenia for the first time. Uh, there's gonna be some 85 uh, US troops. Um, and, and this is clearly designed as a gesture to Moscow saying, look, you are supposed to guarantee the peace, you're not doing it. And mm -hmm. so I'm reaching out to the Americans uh, and then maybe I'll go down that road. And he's also talked about maybe, you know, Russia should leave the Caucasus. At the same time, Macron has got involved. <clears throat> he, um, he held phone conversations both with Pashinyan and with Aliyev uh, in Baku just at the beginning of this month. And this is also the, the Paris mayor getting involved because France, of course, has a very large um, diaspora of, of Armenians living there, as does America. And so, Sorry, Ben, we say, are running um, out of time. We are running out of time. You do make a very good point. I want to put this to Anna as well. Anna, are you afraid that if something radical doesn't happen very soon, that we are going to see another war in that region? I am very afraid, and that's a very good question to pose. Um, I think the lack of an institutionalized peace process is problematic. The sabotage of a Western uh, negotiation tracks by Baku is problematic. Baku, th there is credibility problem. Uh, I understand that Farid is mentioning this route and alternatives, Baku, this X, Y, Z, but the problem is Baku in parallel has also been using force since 2020, in both in Nagorno-Karabakh as well as in, in Armenia. So I am worried that- Thank you, Anna. We are running out of time, and I do want to- Thank you, Anna. You've, you've yeah. said it very succinctly. I just want to ask the exact same question to Farid as well. Farid, are you afraid the war might break out? I don't think that in a large scale uh, things like war happens because um, I don't think so. Uh, but uh, small provocations happens all the time. And the, the most, um, how to say, worrisome uh, element of that, that still on the Azerbaijan's territory, we have illegal troops. I want to thank all our guests, Farid Shafiev, Anna Ohanyan, and Ben Aris. And I want to thank you as well for watching. See the program anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on X, formerly known as Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the entire team here. Bye for now.